the other day, me and my friend were having a discussion about what what kind of music we find beautiful, and I was I was curious, like, why do I find the things uh, that I find beautiful, like? Why do I find them beautiful? And then I picked up this book by George Santayana called On the Sense of Beauty. And it gave me some fresh insights. And I would like to share. It's almost like a... I'm going to share some of the stuff he says in the book. Not everything. And most of those things will be the things that, are, that, were, that stood out to me that affected me and helped me in my own thinking. So first thing is Santayana thinks that beauty is pleasure objectified in an object. Um, now... If it's just pleasure and it's not objectified, then we're not going to find that object beautiful, right? It'll just be a pleasure that we experience in our organs. And this kind of connection that we have, or this uh, feeling that we have of our organs when we experience the pleasure, that's exactly what we're trying to get away from when we're trying to, when we get the experience of beauty. Because beauty is something we find objectified in something, right? Like if I find, let's say, this chalkboard or this uh, whiteboard behind me beautiful, I'm going to see it as a quality of the whiteboard. Even though Santayana goes on to point that it is an objectification and it, the beauty actually doesn't, doesn't actually exist in the board, right? So that's the first point, that beauty is pleasure objectified in the object. The second thing I found really amazing that blew my mind was he says we find things beautiful because we have an ideal type for those things. Now, what does he mean by ideal type? This is something I encountered in sociology too. It's like, or in Plato's forms kind of. It's, um, let's say I think of chairs, okay? <laughs> All the chairs that I've seen in my lifetime, there must have been thousands. But I have an idea of what an ideal chair would look like, maybe. And it's a kind of a composite image in my mind. It's an aggregate of all the chairs that I've seen in my lifetime. And I have a kind of a version of, in my mind, of this average, standard, ideal chair, right? And I'm going to judge all future chairs I see based on this ideal type in my mind, okay? So an example he gives is a guy with nails. Okay, so there's nothing, there's nothing beautiful about nails on a, on a person. Like, like think about it. It's, just, it's You can even see it might even be disgusting, honestly. Like, what the heck is this? But because we've seen so many people with nails, fingernails, that when we see a person without fingernails now, we experience shock. And he calls it incongruity, right? This, incong this incongruity is displeasurable for us, okay? So our minds have been patterned with this ideal type to expect certain things. Now, this points to the utility or the value of having a lot of experience under your belt. Like I always thought, why is it that we trust one person's taste over another person? And this gives me an answer because the person with more experience, the person who has seen more versions of different things, who can compartmentalize his reality into diff more ideas and objects than a lay person can, they'll better be able to um, formulate these ideal types and moreover, make associations. So <laughs> I should have actually mentioned this before. Let me move into this too. There are two ways in which we find an object beautiful. The first is form. So like, let's say, um, like like good language, beautiful language. We, we appreciate the form of the language, right? Like Shakespeare writes in, in poetry. We appreciate that. The second is the associations that the form brings for us, right? So let's say I see the clouds. There might be nothing, no kind of form there that I'm, able to discern but it reminds me of let's say a whale or something and then it, it triggers recollections reminiscing reverie and I associate these pleasurable associations with the object that I'm seeing so another utility of being of being well versed having a lot of experience is that you can call up a lot more associations when you see things okay associations that someone who hasn't experienced as much of life they will not be able to make those connections okay so I like that it's like there is utility to reading more books, to see, to traveling more, um, kind of refining your taste through experience, right? So let's say a person who speaks two languages, I think, will be better able to appreciate beauty in the world than someone who speaks one language. Or someone, like, I'm going to, it's kind of like humble bragging, like I was raised on Indian music, but very, very early on I started listening to world music, African music, Arabic music. I like a lot of different world's uh, area's music and this allows me to I think better appreciate music than someone who was only brought up in a Western culture right so okay there's that um, what else the third thing the third thing that really stu stood out for me from this book is that 
this idea that aesthetic pleasure or aesthetic value is a pure positive okay now in our society we're so quick to think that moral value is is um well we hold up moral value right and the problem with holding up moral value is that morality only deals with negatives it tries to alleviate alleviate evils right so then when we hold up morality or moral values we think you cannot experience the good without the bad okay but if you hold up aesthetic values instead then you can have you can appreciate that maybe a world where everything is good is actually pleasurable or it's a good thing right you don't need the evil to balance out the good so santayana's point is that the reason we always think that evil has to accommodate the good like yin and yang is because we're holding up moral values instead of aesthetic values now why is this important it's because when i talk to people it's like they've lost the ability to imagine a better future they always think that you know what life is you have to take the, the the good with the bad okay and i think this is a kind of false consciousness it stops you from envisioning a better future for yourself in which good outweighs the bad right and he says like if you if you took an unalloyed unadulterated good it would be a lot of creativity a lot of time to make artwork uh ex exploration things like these and, and then i started thinking like holy shit i've always thought we needed the bad to appreciate the good but actually we could have a hell of a lot of fun in a purely good world, like the exploration, the artwork. Um, I mean, you can, you can imagine a lot of good things, just talking to people, whatever, right? So hold up aesthetic values instead of moral ones. Morality does not deal with positives because there's something absurd about the injunction to say, go have fun, right? Or go enjoy yourself, go, ha go look for pleasure. We don't say that. We say, you know what? Don't harm people, don't do evil, don't do this, don't do that, right? Or the other side that morality deals with is neglects. Like, don't neglect to help someone. Don't neglect to save the child drowning in the bathtub. But you, there's something absurd about saying, go have fun, right? That's that's now trespassing onto the realm of aesthetic values now, okay? Um, yeah, I think I'll end it there. These were the few key points I got from Santayana's book on the sense of beauty. Thanks.